Well, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited about the message this morning because it comes to us with a, a story that's attached to us that, to me, puts Jesus in a kind of a different light than, than quite often you see him. So, guys, back there in the back, I want to start with the uh, I want to start with the gospel message, the story, uh, not Jesus the dog sitter, but but Jesus with the Canaanite woman. So uh, let's look at Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. It's entitled in our passage this morning, The Faith of the Canaanite Woman. Leaving that place, and again, we'll talk about where that place is in the message, but leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks, be, to God. thanks be to God couple of questions before we jump into it. When you hear the word retreat, what do you think of? A, a day camp, a getaway, a, a vacation? A... So, um, in the gospel message, Matthew tells us that Jesus retreated to Tyre and Sidon. If they were, if, if Jerusalem is here, I'm going to try to do this backwards so you can see if Jesus is here in the Sea of Galilee around Jerusalem in that area, Tyre and Sidon, the Sidon are on the coast over here on the on the western side. So he traveled, which means he walked about fifty miles. But was that trip only to retire? And what does it mean when Jesus was said to have retired to that region. So even though Jesus retired to that region, he continued his outreach of healing, didn't he? He was still working even though he was retreating to that area. Now the woman was a Greek, a Phoenician, a Gentile, and typically they were considered enemies of Israel, enemies of the Jewish people. But her strength and her courage and her faith wins out in this story. Jesus healed her dying daughter, even though she was not a Jew. But as I focus on the words of Matthew, as I think about the things that Jesus said to that woman, it seems slanderous to me that, that Jesus would call her out in those derogatory terms. He called, he called her the dogs. But that was a common term in those days for, for Gentiles. But think of this miracle healing and how it came about and who was involved with it. And then right after that healing, Jesus returned to his region that place around the Sea of Galilee, that place near Jerusalem. Question in my heart, was she the only reason that Jesus retired to Tyre and Sidon? Because if Jesus wanted the Israelites to be the focal point, the focus of, of, the, of the gospel being shared with others, what in the world did Jesus do? Why in the world did Jesus go into Gentile country? And aren't you surprised, aren't you crushed for the woman that Jesus would talk to her that way 
And yet she still had the courage to stand up and say, Lord, here are my needs. She knelt down before him. And he said another crushing remark, didn't he? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So now in the story is the time when Jesus gets the surprise. Kind of like the surprise attack. Her response was, yes it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I was thinking about this during the week. Had an opportunity in this tumultuous week I've had and the things going on. I took a break in the afternoon and Candy was sitting with Zim and Kent was at his work and Shelly was up in this area. And I said, you want to go get a, a snack? It's too late for lunch and too early for dinner, but let's go get a snack. And so we went and split a sandwich. And, and while we were talking, she asked me about today. What was I doing for today? And I said, well, it's a, it's a story of uh, a woman that Jesus encountered so that he could heal her daughter. And she goes, I don't remember that. What is, what would you say that would help me understand? I, it's where Jesus called the Gentiles dogs. And she goes, oh, I know that one. She says, that reminds me, if my phone rings, I'm waiting for a call from Tampa. I have a new client down in Tampa who wants me to come and take care of their dogs for a week. Seems like it's becoming more and more lucrative, but it's also becoming a, an opportunity like a safety net outreach for families. Because those with pets and children and big families or small families, they have to plan where they go and how they leave their 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 loved ones and and so people like Shelly step in at the right time and take care of their pets and take care of their homes. So Tampa seems a long way away. It's even further than the distance between the Sea of Galilee and Sidon. And Jesus walked over 50 miles because he had compassion and even compassion for a different breed of people. He called them the dogs. And so I would say to you that this is where Jesus becomes a dog sitter. He comes and shares love and compassion with those that were not favored by others. He came and shared with them and cared for them and healed their family. But what was driving this woman? She becomes so bold even with Jesus. And I would say to you, it's faith that drives us in a way of compassion, in a, in a way of being bold, in a way of being faithful. And it seems to me also that his disciples may have needed a little boost in their faith as well. In the words that they wrote in Matthew, the disciples said to Jesus, send her away, get rid of her. What they were saying is, she's a Gentile. She's not important to us. Now, there are only three people in the Bible that Jesus commends for their faith. Remember the story of the Roman centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. He commended him on his faith. But remember the woman who had the, the issue of, of, of bleeding who said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And she was healed. And he commended her on her faith. And this woman, a Gentile, a Phoenician, a Greek, who came to Jesus with boldness. The bottom line is, none of those three, by law, by right, should have even approached Jesus in any way. But especially as this woman did boldly, because it was against Jewish law for them as Gentiles to approach 
a person of the Jewish persuasion. And Jesus commended all three of them for the, the strength of their faith. The woman in our story today was desperate for help. And her faith drove her request. Her faith drove her towards Jesus. It reminds me of that old saying, desperate death. Say that with my tongue. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Have you heard that before? Yes. Well, here's the, the response I would give to you. Really, it should it should say, desperate times call for Jesus. Amen. And that's our faith, isn't it? That's where we are strongest. Desperate times call for Jesus and let us call on Jesus in those times. It is interesting that the woman was not from the Jewish faith, but she, didn't she address Jesus as Lord? Yes. That's different. She addressed him as Lord. She refers to him as a supreme being, a, a master. How did she know who Jesus was? You see, even at a time when the disciples were struggling, when they were unsure of Jesus' claims as it related to them as, as followers, as it related to the world, here is a foreigner who recognized the true identity of who Jesus was. She thought, saw the power of life and love and compassion in his hands. And somehow she knew that Jesus was her only hope. Those are all the things that are implied and, and sometimes not said in the, the story that's repeated of what was going on and the healings that were going on. It is that there's this faith power that comes to us when we come to, to Jesus. So when Jesus makes the comment that his ministry is directed to the house of Israel, don't you know that his disciples were going right on? In other words, back off. This is not for you. This is only for us. There's a term for that. It's called jealous protectionism. Let me give you something that might help you understand. Some of you will may, may understand even more than others. A, a contemporary image of this is, is, the, is the image of Harley Davidson. So stretch with me here just for a moment. Harley Davidson has this family of, of riders. All you have to do is go to your local Harley Davidson dealership and you'll see that the owners are in love with not only motorcycles, but they're in love with the brand. The, the brand Harley Davidson. They put them on their, their trucks, they put them on their shirts, their clothes, their bandanas. Their, they put them on their bodies as a tattoo. They take this orange and black shield, this Harley Davidson, and they'll tattoo their body with, with the brand. They're bold. They're a family that is bold in, in their love of the brand. But sometimes, don't you think that that boldness scares off prospective customers, potential riders of Harleys, part of their family expanding? Because you see, the newbies to motorcycles don't have the, the, the lingo, the, the words, the thought, the understanding of who it is. Maybe they haven't grown their hair out yet. Maybe, maybe, maybe they haven't tattooed or even bought a t-shirt. But sometimes that kind of boldness scares off the potential. And Harley Davidson as a corporation has started to understand that thought, that philosophy. And the, the CEO tells us that, yeah, we understand newbies don't have the lingo. We understand they're nervous and don't know how to get started. But maybe, just maybe, he says, not my words, but his, maybe we need to just, to just lighten our image without losing our edge. So what does that mean? It means that they need to work on how do you in, encourage new people to come into the family of writers. 
But sometimes new people find those of that family intimidating. Can you say the same thing about our church? All churches, but our church in particular. Are we like Jesus' disciples? Having this special edge, this special family, this special idea of who we are? And do we seem standoffish or bold or outgoing or something to the to the public who would maybe like to try it, but they don't know the lingo? And they don't feel comfortable, they feel intimidated. We tend to be intimidating to folks who fall into that category. So the question is, do we need to curb our enthusiasm, cut down on our stuffiness, and lighten our image without losing the edge of Jesus? So there's a, a dealership in Memphis, Tennessee, and they offer this, this class that's called... Um, the rider's edge. People who want to be involved, want to get on motorcycles, want to, to uh, have a Harley Davidson, get invited to come to this class. It's, it's 16 hours, so it's the whole weekend. And they're riding these motorcycles, this 400 pound hog, I think I saw in their ad. And they drive through these red and uh, orange and green fluorescent cones to learn how to maneuver. And then there's a class that goes with it that talks about who Harley Davidson is. Who they are, how the bikes are made, how they're sold, and why people are so dedicated they're willing to tattoo their body with their logo. You see, the CEO says, I want to take outsiders and make them become insiders. Take away the intimidation and turn it into an invitation. Can't we learn from what Harley Davidson is doing in Memphis, Tennessee? Can't we learn how to turn people who are outside and bring them inside without the intimidation that you need to know everything before you get here? Uh, like Jesus we have to be willing to curb our time-honored traditions if we're going to reach generations that know nothing of who we are as Christians. We can't afford to come across like the disciples did with Jesus. Ask her to leave. Tell them to go. She's not one of us. It's our ability to become willing to reach out. It's our requirement to be bold but not intimidating. It's our requirement to do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Oh yeah, not only that, it's the lifeblood of the Christian faith. Can we do that? Can you do that? I think that's the question we must ponder this week. And all the children say, Amen. Amen. Amen.